So the title of this talk is about a question that I'd like you to ask yourself. And what is, uh, the question is, what is your brand's true character? So just uh, take a moment to ask uh, whether you can answer this question easily or not. And I just want to make sure that the question is not interpreted the wrong way. I'm not asking you who are your brand characters, right? I'm asking you to think about what is your brand's true character. So what do I mean by that? You can go to the dictionary and look for de definitions of, brand, of character in general as applied to people, and you'll hear definitions that would say the combinations of mental characteristics and behaviors that distinguishes an individual or a group, okay? so the distinguishing nature of something, the mental and moral qualities distinctive to an individual, the quality of being an individual typically in an interesting or unusual way. So really what I'm asking you to think about what is your brand's true character? I'm asking you to think about something that is deep inside your brand that pertains to its mental, moral, or behavioral character that really sets it apart from other entities, other brands that exist in the marketplace. And I just wanted to walk you through a couple of examples of brands that I think have characters and brands that I don't think have as much character. Okay? So just look at these two brands here. Does one of the two have more character than the other one? How about these two? Does one of the two have more character than the other one? How about these two brands in the car category? Does one of the two have more character than the other one? Maybe one more pair. How about these two supermarkets? Does one of the two have more character than the other one? And I've looked at the data and I know the answer. For most of you, you would say the one on the right had more character. And why is that, that some of those brands have more characters than other ones, and where this character is coming from and in what form? And that's the question that I've been asking myself for the past two years uh, with some of my colleagues. And one of the things we do at the Brands Center the, um, is uh, to work with companies that are willing to share their data with us and try to mine their data to generate insights that are broadly applicable and generalizable. And over the past two years, we have uh, received data and analyzed data that allow us to really identify what we call the genetic makeup of true brand character. And the data that we have access to is data that was shared with us with, uh, from BAV Consulting, a major brand consulting agency. And what they have, and if you don't know them, they have a major database that they call the Brand Asset Validator, which is uh, a brand tracking uh, study that somehow tracks over 50,000 brands throughout the world uh, in 50 different countries, uh, testing almost 900,000 consumers you know, every quarter or so, and they do work with academic partners like us to try to help them look at their data and sort of see the insights that are revealed in there. So we got access to this data, and uh, we're gonna sh I'm going to share with you our findings from looking at a slice of 20 years of data in the U.S. that cover roughly 6,000 brands that were tracked in terms of brand perceptions, in terms of different brand metrics over the past um, 20 years. And what we found is that brand character, brand character really rests on six major factors. If you want to find the DNA of a brand that has strong or weak character, or strong character rather than weak, it will rest on one of the six major dimensions that I'm about to walk you through. The first one that we found is um, that strong brands, uh, strong character brands, some of them rest, uh, rest on the fact that they are innovative. Okay? So when consumers look at those brands, they say, you know, that brand is innovative, it's, it's progressive, it's visionary, it's up to date, it's smart. These are the kind of brands that they say, okay, that brand stands out to us. And uh, of course, the brands like that would be the usual suspects, the Googles of the world, the Amazon, the Apple, SpaceX will be the kind of brands that score very well on these dimensions. Now, it's also interesting to look at the brands that don't score well on being innovative. Okay? So here are some of the examples. Miller High Life, Lucky Strike, the Chicago Cubs, Bob Evans. These are the kind of brands that do not score well in terms of being innovative 
you do not have strong character with respect to that dimension. The second factor we found is at work is a factor that you would call, we could call classiness. Some brands stand out and have characters because consumers associate with them terms such as it's upper class, it's prestigious, it's glamorous, it's stylish, it is distinctive because of the style of that brand. Now, of course, those brands tend to skew very heavily toward the luxury brands, the Rolex of the world, the Tiffany's of the world, Louis Vuitton, the Rick Scalton will be the kind of brands that score very well on those dimensions. Now, there are brands that don't score well in terms of classiness. So let me show you. Okay. And I, was, I had to check that it was okay to share this data. Uh, budget doesn't do too well. Taco Bell doesn't do well. Realtor.com doesn't do too well. Motel 6 will be brands that score poorly in terms of classiness. We're not done yet. Keep going. There's a third way of having strong brand character. The third one is a, a dimension that was surprising to us because it's not something that we think of naturally when we look at brands. And it's a dimension that we could call fun. Some brands have strong characters because they come across as being fun. And what do consumers mean when they say this brand is fun? Well, they say it's charming, it's friendly, it's carefree. It has a uniqueness element to it that makes it fun. So the usual suspect in that dimension is pretty obvious. Disney will be one of them. But think of other properties, such as Cirque du Soleil is a brand that consumers consider to be very fun and having character because of that. Uh, Build-A-Bear will be one of those. YouTube is a brand that consumers consider to be a fun brand. Strong character because of the fun uh, aspect embedded in that brand. Now notice that these brands are fun, and that's why uniqueness actually correlates with that. They are fun because they each offer something very special to the consumer experience that sets them apart. Because part of being fun requires that you be unique on some aspects. Now there are brands that are not fun. So let me tell you which are they are. I mean, you know, I picked them. They're not the only one. Okay? Goldman Sachs is not fun. <laughs> Wall Street Journal is not fun. Duracell is not fun. And surprise, the US Congress is not fun. <laughs> one fourth dimension that we identify, and this is a very important one, is a dimension that you could call trustworthiness, dependability, something like that. There are brands that are not glamorous, they're not fun necessarily, they are not innovative per se, but consumers just really like them because they associate with them things such as it's trustworthy, it's reliable, I think it's the best brand in that category, it does the job well, it's high quality, it's traditional. That's the kind of things that consumers are picking up on. Okay. And brands like that are heavily product focused. We heard about Ziploc being one of the brands mentioned earlier. Band-Aid will be a classic one. John Deere, Levi's, traditional you know, products that we inter interact with on a daily, daily, daily basis and that somehow we come, come to trust over the years. Now there are brands that we don't trust. Bitcoin is low on trustworthiness. Kardashian Collection not very good on trustworthiness. MySpace scored low on that dimension. Now, surprisingly, I didn't know how it came about, but uh, Cialis, low on trustworthiness. So there's something about dependability that somehow doesn't score well. I don't know where that comes from. The next dimension we found is something that we could call, for lack of a better term, daring energy. There are brands that stand out in terms of character because people say, this is an energetic brand. Dynamics, daring, it's rugged, it's arrogant. There's some brands that are very action-oriented, that are very confident, they are go-getter type of brands. So in that space, you have a lot of very sports-oriented properties. So the Olympic Games, or any of the professional leagues, NASCAR is one of them. But then other brands, such as Six Flags, some of the movie properties, like Star Wars, very energetic, dynamic. There are things that move along, very action-oriented. These brands are doing very well on their daring energy. There are some brands that don't do well on that dimension. It's not necessarily a bad thing, but brands such as Healthy Choice, Curel, Campbell's, Comforting, brands that are somehow laid back, that are soothing, do not score well 
on this daring energy dimension. The sixth factor and the last one I'll share with you, and that's the last one that I have to share with you, is uh, a um, dimension that we could call caring. Does the brand seem to care about others? It's not caring about themselves, but caring about others. That's very important. You will see in the dimensions that consumers are picking up. They say it's socially responsible, it's kind, it's helpful, it's obliging, it is independent, independent in the way it does things compared to other brands. And brands that do very well in that dimension will be mostly, as you suspect, a lot of non-for-profit, charity type of brands, Habitat for Humanity would be one like that. But other brands such as Sesame Street, PBS, Walgreens do very well in that dimension. Some brands that do not do well in the caring dimension, who doesn't care? Ask yourself. Surprisingly, it, it makes sense once you see them, the brands that do, do score, score poorly on caring are brands that are very self-focused. Brands like Under Armour, Beats, IMAX Theater, Dyson, brands where the attention is on the on the self and the consumer's own personal experience, these are the brands that are seen as being less caring. So, in a, in a nutshell, we have six major pillars for building strong brand characters, okay? So now, let's sort of see whether it matters or not to have strong brand characters. And uh, we plow through the data and we correlated these dimensions and the scores on brand characters with the various metrics and share with you some of the, the results. So here's our different profiles. Let me sort of share with you some of the results in terms of brand character. Quick service restaurants, let's sort of see on the X axis are, is a measure of how high you score on brand character, so how high your bars would be across the board. Okay, and here's our brands that have, you know, relatively low bars. There are brands that sort of stand out here. So, for example, American Red Cross, very caring, solid, high trustworthiness, good profile. Apple, of course, very high in innovativeness, but still good profile, not lacking on, uh, on any one dimension. More, uh, Harley Davidson, good on trustworthiness, very good on daring energy. So these are good profiles, if you look at the height of these bars on average and you correlate that with brand preference, here's what you can see. This is in the context of uh, quick service restaurants, strong relationship, strong prediction of how much people like a brand. It's not perfect, of course, but the more brand character you have, the higher your bars are in that industry, the smaller your brand. Consumers will like your brand relative to other brands in that industry. If you look at uh, internet telecom services, very strong correlation. This is one of the strongest we've seen in our data. Okay? If you look at airlines, very strong correlation. If you look at beer, it's a bit weaker, but it's still substantial correlation. If you look at countries, very, very strong correlation. Some countries have strong character in the minds of consumers, other countries, have weak character, very, very strong predictor of how much people would like that country relative to other countries. Okay? So overall, you see that having strong brand character really matters. It does really matter. Now, the next question you asked me, right, how do I get there and what do I care about if I want to build a strong brand character? Well, you have to look at each of the dimensions, okay, and, and just, I just look at the dimensions on average. Let's look at each of the ones separately. And uh, through the BAV data, we can track how important those dimensions are over time. And uh, this is a chart that's going to show you the last 10 years of uh, how important those dimensions are in defining the characters of a brand, of brands collectively. And what you'll see is that at the top there is trustworthiness. By far the most important driver of the character of a brand is the how trustworthy, dependable it is. You don't have to be super glamorous, but trustworthiness, high quality, dependability is going to be a major way of getting there. The second most important dimension that is far below that one would be innovativeness. Innovativeness is the second one. It defines about 20% or so of what people see as being strong character. And then you have a cluster of two more dimensions that are somewhat less important. This is uh, 
the classiness dimension, so the luxury aspect of a brand, that's important, it is significant, but it's about a third of how important it is to be a trustworthy brand. That's tied with the fun element. And the last two dimensions that are at the bottom of this list would be the daring energy and uh, the caring aspect of a brand. So if you want to plan to build a strong brand character, this is already a roadmap that will give you a sense of everything else being equal, what's going to carry more weight. Now, you can look at this. Of course, it's going to depend a little bit on the industry. Right? So we can do the analysis and see how predictive are each of the dimensions of brand preference across different industries. And the, the, I'm not going to read for the entire chart here, but for trustworthiness, you can see that the more the bar to the right, the more it helps you in terms of brand preference. And you can see there's a lot of industry for which brand uh, trustworthiness is going to help you a lot. Telecom will be one of them, uh, computer electronics, print media, internet, gas utilities, pretty much all industries are going to be well served by having high trustworthiness. Okay. Um, innovativeness, again, it helps across a wide range of industries. Of course, you're going to have uh, the internet type of businesses, but it's also relevant for appliance tools, distribution retail, um, automobiles, countries, telecommunications, uh, QSR, uh, quick service restaurants. All these companies and industries are rewarded by having more perceived innovativeness in their, in their brand. If you go for fun and brand preference, it also helps across the board. A wide range of industries benefit for having a fun element. And it's not just the Disney's of the world, it helps uh, for beverages, it helps for movies, it helps for print media, uh, it helps uh, for toys, obviously. For countries, health and beauty can uh, benefit from the fun element in, uh, of brand character. Now, classiness, you'll see now there are many more bars on the left here. Somehow it's much more selective what kind of industries would benefit from adding more classes. Not everybody needs to be classy, okay? A lot of brands, in fact, are going to be hurt. The bars on the left are telling you it's going to hurt you to actually try to be more classy. So brands so that would be in the internet, telecom, are being hurt from being more classy because internet is meant to be for everybody, telecom is meant to be everybody, for everybody, and this is not helpful to be trying to yourself to be classy. All right, and then so I keep going here, daring energy, again, you see much more selective in terms of which industry would uh, benefit from wearing characters, a few industries on the right benefit, uh, quite a few industries on the left uh, uh, lose from brand. Uh, character in terms of daring energy and caring by and large does very well. It is one of the dimensions that seems to be helping brands a lot across a wide range of industries. So one of the things we did is uh, also look at, all right, what are the major ways of competing on brand character? Okay? And what we did is a big analysis called a cluster analysis where we look at 3,000 brands in 2013 and sort of put them in eight buckets in terms of their profiles of brand character. And we sort of, know and sort of track on this chart here how well they're doing in terms of brand preference. The higher the, brand, uh, the, the bar, the more brand preference those brands in that set are able to collect. So one cluster we identified as the humble dependables. They are like the brands that are not very expensive, but they're very trustworthy, very dependable, doing very well here. So you see this spike on trustworthiness, nothing out of the ordinary on the other dimension. Um, those brands here are, generate very high degrees of preference, and you see some examples. Duracell will be one, Huggies, uh, Band-Aid will be classic one. Then the innovator brands, tend to do very well. Of course, uh, the technology-oriented brands do uh, well. Their Subaru scores high there. Um, so they're very high on innovativeness, but then notice that they're somehow they're not just a spike. They are somehow a little bit of thickness in that space. He's showing you that they are not lacking on some other dimensions. Only 6% uh, of the brands fill that profile. Okay. The dependable fund uh, are doing quite well. These are 
the one segment where we found two spikes, okay? They're doing very well on the, the trustworthiness. This is something we can trust, and they are fun at the same time. So these two seem to be a good recipe for success. So Legos, Barbie, Mars, uh, doing very well in terms of brand preference. The glamorous single spike brands. Okay, these are the luxury brands of the world. Only 5% of them, they have a single peak here that you see on the classiness. Uh, not too narrow the width here, telling you they're not lacking too much on the dimensions, but they tend to be single peak. Those ones are doing okay, you know, in terms of brand preference, but not outstanding. Okay. We have uh, the vigorous brands. Okay, these are the macho brands, if you will. Uh, Playboy, Marlboro, NASCAR, Kentucky Derby, Guinness, uh, the um, you know, brands that are mostly driven by daring energy. Then we have here, and this is an interesting one, this is the involved citizens. These are the brands that are defined largely by being caring, but notice they are caring, and that's not enough to be caring. You need to be good on other dimensions. So they're doing well on, uh, on trustworthiness, on innovativeness, on classy, etc. So caring is not enough, I'd say. It doesn't carry the day, but having caring on top of other things, doing okay on other drivers of brand character seems to be very helpful here, and you see those brands are doing quite well. Now, I just described about 50% of the brands. There are 50% that basically don't have character, and those ones are not gonna do well. They're on the last two to part here. I'm sorry, I'm going to share some of the names. Um, um, these are sets that we're going to call, we call the forgettable pleasures. Okay? These are the brands that the issue here. Nothing stands out really, no major spikes there. Those brands are doing poorly in terms of brand preference. And the last and they are about 26% of all the brands out there. And then another 23% we call the seriously insipid. Uh, you can sort of see a very, very small character footprint, right? So those things, there's nothing that stands out there. And, uh, and these are brands, of course, that are being penalized in terms of brand preference. So let me sort of wrap up some of uh, what uh, are the major lessons. And as a professor, I'd like to have a very bullet point type of summary. First of all, you need to care about this question I asked you at the beginning. The character of your brand matters. And I'll show you a lot of data about that. If you want to know what is the footprint and what is the DNA of your character, you need to track six major dimensions. Trustworthiness, innovativeness, classiness, fun, daring energy, and caring. Some of those dimensions are more important than other ones. Trustworthiness is by far the most important, followed by innovativeness, followed by fun and classiness tied, and then the last and the least important across industries, on average, uh, uh, would be daring energy and caring. Of course, it would vary by industries. And one of the things that you need to take away is that not any one industry owns any one dimension. So it's not that classiness is owned only by luxury or um, innovativeness only by technology. As I showed you with some of my charts, a lot of industries can benefit from trustworthiness or by innovativeness, etc., if it is added to other dimensions. Next point is that if you have to build a brand character strategy, don't try to achieve too much. What we find are the robust brand characters have a single spike, a single spike or two spikes, okay? But what they have in common is that when they have those little spikes there, one or two, they actually are very solid also across the board, so they are, they are somehow not lacking on other dimensions of brand character. Okay, thank you very much, uh, and uh, I'll be open for questions.